We're speaking today to Guy Duncan, Harry Duncan's youngest son, um, and I have a, a series of questions here for you, Guy. Um, the first one is, what was it like for you growing up with two very creative parents? Well, my you know father was a printer, publisher, poet, and my mother was a storyteller, the executive director of a children's theater. So it was yin and yang. It was it was yin in the in the, it was very very wonderful in the sense that yeah I had two very creative parents who were living their passion, living their art, doing that day in day out. But also it could be also very bad because you had two very passionate parents who didn't necessarily care about laundry. Or, <laughs> you know, so sometimes in the Duncan household it could be running with scissors. So it was good and bad. But it, at the end of the day they were very very focused on in terms of doing what was in your heart and fo really following that and trying to and that was a good example and that's that's something good to live by. Can you describe an early memory of your father at the printing press? When we we lived in West Branch in West Branch, Iowa, right outside of Iowa City. Uh, I was born in 1966 and we moved when I was five. And I have very very vivid memory of Harry's press. It was on the side of the house and it was actually on part of the house. It was west and it had windows where you got good southern light and I can remember the winter and the snow falling and um, and the sun and the snow and all that kind of stuff corresponding and being in that press room and seeing the press and smelling the ink and the paper. I also really distinctly remember um, his, uh, his hands and after a long day of printing I can remember the smell of that turpentine and I can remember the smell of the ink and the paper. I don't know what it is about press rooms but there's always a coolness to them. In other words printers don't like their press room hot particularly when they're putting ink down because the, the ink becomes runny and so those rooms were always cooler and so in the summer he would always keep the press room cool and uh, so I've just got a memory, a conscious memory that the press room was always cold. Was that the same time when he was working with Juan Pasco? Was that when Juan was in yeah, so, yeah, so Juan, Juan and Juan Pasco actually lived in a um, a little house that was back behind our house, and I would uh, go back and visit Juan. Juan would you know toy with me, you know, this little four or five year old, and he would tell tell me that Frankenstein lived in the basement, <laughs> and there was a trap door that was like a little crawl space, and he would say Frankenstein's down there, and I would always and I would close egg him on, and I would be like, where's Frankenstein, you know, and he would say, well, Frankenstein, I would, he would shake the door, and then of course I would act like I was scared. And I, I think you mentioned this when we talked the first time, but how did Juan come to know your father and get connected with him through? My mom was taught at Scattergood, which was in West Branch, which was a Quaker school, a day school, and I believe it's just high school primarily, boarding school, boy and girl. And uh, Juan was actually a student there. He came there as a student, met my parents, talked to Harry, actually found out a little bit about present, printing and publishing, left, went to university. Harry was a professor at the University of Iowa at the Writers' Workshop and then the School of Journalism, and he would primarily print on evenings and weekends. And so then he would he would do that with Juan. At the writer's workshop, was that a place where he met a lot of writers then when he was working at Iowa City? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. He was affiliated with the School of Journalism because at that time the press, the independent presses or the hand press work was under the School of Journalism at the University of Iowa. Oh, okay. And then one of the printers that he worked with was, was Keith Acapol. Now, um, Keith Acapol was a printmaker. Very, very good friend of Harry's, and he actually illustrated some of those books that Harry has, and those are some beautiful, those are beautiful be books. Exceptional, exceptional stuff. The Keith Keith Ackable stuff is some of my favorite. And favorites. we have a lot of correspondence in the collection too. And then Kim Merker was the other printer, a prominence. And when Harry left, then the the fine arts print at Iowa City, the, that was Kim Kim's press at Iowa City. How did your father's work shape your aesthetic? Well, I'm a technologist, so I work for a global IT outsource company. Two primary, well, probably three primary ways. First was that the relationship between printing and technology. Because at the time, right, when Gutenberg came out with printing and movable type, it was revolution. Very simple concept, but very, very radical in that it became it basically uh, allowed knowledge to be distributed because you could print Bibles for significantly less money than illuminated manuscripts by monks sitting, you know, mm -hmm. who could produce a few per year versus it went to thousands. And then, of course, it went to the liberalization of the press and pre and movement and uns no censorship. 
So the first is that relationship between technology and knowledge. And then I think about the evolution. I used to talk to, about all this a lot with Harry, about the evolution of technology. And it's no different. And he used to always say that he felt very privileged and honored that he was able to print with such an archaic technology. And he used to say that it was an indication of civilization, that we were a civil society because a civil society could afford for people like himself to do something that was archaic but at the same time that the art and the care and the production of it could tell us a lot about that, tell us a lot about that aesthetic. So that, that's the first thing that I think the printing really taught me was that, and that's how I approach technology today as I really look at the relationship of the technology from a historical context. I try to think about it no differently. And if you think about it in those contexts, you know, Facebook is really no different than some form of a printed page a magazine, so to speak, that's self-offered in real time by its participants. So that, that, that's just kind of continued to evolve. The other thing was about censorship. Harry was just, both my parents were just eminent, of just, you know, the freedom of speech and the importance that that played in democracy or that played in society and the also that comes with that, the artistic expression. So I grew up in a house in which there was no censorship. I raised my kids that way. There's certainly appropriateness with that, of course, but at the same time, in terms of free discourse and free opinions and basically being an open dialogue, Harry was 150% about that. And then the third is kind of a rigor, an aesthetic rigor. My wife will kid that I have a, you know, a sharp tongue in terms of my opinion about what I like and what I don't like. And that just was modeled to me, but it was also very much taught to me about my dad's approach to books and this, the, the aesthetics. You know, he didn't really necessarily compromise, he didn't cut corners. Uh, that's one thing surprising when you, I go back and I look at his books. I don't have all of them, right? I've got a lot of them, but I don't have all of them. It's not a bad one. I mean, you can just, you can literally close your eyes and just grab one and look at it, and they're all really, really good. Now, some of the poetry in some of them necessarily isn't as good as some of the others, but that's more so a personal perspective. I think that his accomplishments as a publisher are probably greater than a printer in terms of his eye for poetry. How did he... Ear for poetry, I should say. How did he select the writers that he worked with? They submitted stuff. Earlier when he was at Cummington, it was kind of more a, a group. You know, the, the school at Cummington, it had a lot of writers who visited, who would write there and participate, so it was a little bit somewhat of like an academic setting. Mm -hmm. But he was also connected to that whole scene in New York in that late 30s through the 40s, early 50s. And that was a pretty, that literary community was pretty tight. So I th as an example, he got introduced to Robert Lowell through that circle, right? And then he heard Robert Lowell read poetry and had read some of his poetry. And then actually, my understanding is that he kind of said to Robert Lowell, hey, if you've got a book, I'd like to print it. So, so I think there was some, and I think that was the earlier. After when he was doing Cummington in Iowa at Iowa City, I think then it that kind of tradition continued because writers workshop, great writers, great poets have come. I mean, it's phenomenal mm -hmm. for that. But he gained a reputation as being someone who would be willing to print new poets or or first books of poetry by emerging talent. Mm -hmm. He never sit, put a thing in an article saying hey, we're going to print a book, asking for submissions. He, he never did any of that. He just kind of word of mouth and the stuff just came. I think that the, um, you know, the, the St. Kitts Monkey Feuds was, was totally an anonymous submission. Really? Yeah, he didn't know that guy at all. And I, I believe that like, he had published maybe one or two poems prior to that. That's a great book. I love that book. Now, did you learn to print? Did your yeah. dad teach you how to yes. print? Yeah, I took um, his class. Oh, you did? Yeah, I took his class at UNO. I enjoyed it. You know, I, I liked it. How would you describe your father's work and his influence on other printers? In terms of the hand print press movement, it's really kind of divided of relate. So you've got work done by people like Bonnie O'Connell who have really taken it to a whole nother realm where they've taken the book and deconstructed it and really made the book itself the work of art mm -hmm. as opposed to the poetry, right? So it's kind of a convergence of just the art, the aesthetic itself, irrespective of the words. Probably my dad would say the influence has been nil because <laughs> it's not like you see hundreds of people doing it. And let's be honest, you know, the hand press movement, there's still some that is happening, but it's not like it's going through a renaissance. The numbers have probably decreased pretty, pretty dramatically. Did Harry's love of literature influence you? Oh yeah. 
Like, in in what way? As a kid, they read out loud to me. Um, Your mother being a storyteller. Yeah, Watership Down, and there was constantly books being read aloud, and just the whole aesthetic. They were always reading. It was kind of expected that you would read too. So that that influence of literature has been you know really really profound. So it's you know books books are part of the fabric of the world that I live in. Uh-huh. So uh-huh. I couldn't imagine a world without books. What do you think your father valued most about hand printed books? He I think kept th- him I, doing it. I think it was the process. Strictly the process. I think he really enjoyed the process of creating, of making those books. He used to say that his best printed books were the ones in which he forgot the most bef- between the time that he finished the last one. So he used to always love that process of relearning everything. Interesting. And I think that's one of the reasons why the form itself changes so much with his books. But yet, I mean, it's always got a Harry Duncan look and a feel and aesthetic to it. But the papers change, the bindings change, the the artists that he collaborates with change. There's some that are extremely aggressive. There are some that are very subtle. There are some that have hand done binding. There are some that, you know, he had a binder up in Minneapolis do. Some have Japanese paper, some have French paper. The typefaces change. People would just cringe. He would have a whole set of, let's say, Gaudi type, and he would just get rid of it and just get something else because yeah. he just was done with it because yeah. he wanted a different aesthetic. Harry, there was always an element of Harry to what he did, but if you were to say to somebody, okay, what's the common theme between these books? There's a, a really good chance that you would not know that Harry Duncan had anything to do with any of them. There wasn't anything about his ego. He was so zen about non-presence within his art that it actually ends up that he dominates the arts. You know, it's a contradiction. And I remember he, you know, he would get angry with the poets he was printing because he would, would say, I want to use this kind of paper. And he would be like, no, your poetry has nothing to do with Japanese paper at all. You're definitely a French Maybe paper Maybe it was guy. like a cosmetic <laughs> thing that they thought, and then, yeah, but he exactly. didn't see it meshing at all. That's right. Well, of all the books your father printed, did he have favorites, and which ones were some of his favorites? Well, I think he was very, he had absolutely a reverence for the, what I call the high Cummingtons, that period of 44 to 49. I don't know if I have those dates right, but you know, there's a period in Cummington where it's just this kind of opus. Uh-huh. Whitman, where uh-huh. the illustrations, the hovering fly, the Wall Stevens books. And he was very reverent about that period. He never would come out and say that it was favorite. It's interesting though. About that period, he would also say he felt that that was very much his sophomoric period of printing. And he would kind of embarrassingly say he was uh, getting in the way, that he was outdoing the writer or outdoing the poetry in some ways. The Bogan book, I know he loved. He was a big fan of that book. Uh, I remember when he got done, he felt like... I can remember him distinctly just being very, very proud of that book. What was it about that book that made him feel particularly happy about it? The thing that he liked about the Bogan book was that, in terms of the subject matter, it feels this way. It really has that right sentiment. But the the other thing that he loved about this was the prints from... Priscilla Steele. She came and lived with us and printed, worked three weeks. And one thing that's unique about this is that every print is hand colored differently. So she did 220 of them, but every single one is different. So each book is really has a uniqueness to it. William Maxwell, who is now dead, who's kind of a writer's writer, short story novelist, lived in New York City, edited this. It just has a a firmness to it, but he was really, really happy with how this book turned out. And then last poems, Barbara Gibbs, Poets Like Oysters. One of the reasons why he loved this book so much was the poetry. I mean, he really felt like he was able to do a book and do it in a way, I believe, that was very harmonious with the poet. And he really felt like he was getting behind it and that he was not obstructing. There was nothing flashy. It was just kind of a Zen meditation in which he really laid it out. And if you read this book, it's kind of interesting. It just kind of feels like the poetry. And the Karen Kuntz illustrations are just like fabulous. Karen's a great illustrator. Well, that's it for my questions today. Thank you very much for for allowing us a a (laughs) chance to talk to you and ask you questions. I really appreciate it. You bet. Thank you.